When I was a kid, yes, I know, I too promised to never say that growing up, and here we are. So, when I was a kid, automotive safety meant wearing a lap belt and holding on tight. No electronics of any sort. There was barely any kind of mechanical design. One click, and I was done. And you better pull that belt tight. (laughs) Now, if we're thinking about automotive safety today, terms like multi-layer varistors, TVS diodes, electromagnetic interference, and supercapacitors come to mind. That's not just me, right? Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Yes, it's been more than a couple decades since that one-click safety business, and cars have come a long way since those days. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Daniel West from AVX and I are looking at automotive safety electronics and how choosing the right passive components can make all the difference in power quality, advanced EMI suppression, circuit protection and antenna communication. All right, let's get going. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about passive component solutions for automotive safety electronics from AVX. Hi, Daniel. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, Amelia. Thanks for having me here. Okay, so Daniel, we're here to talk about automotive safety. So what do you think are the biggest issues here we should be concerned about? The innovations that I'm going to speak to today provide an advantage to performance, reliability, or cost by allowing a size reduction, a consolidation of passive components that are commonly used as solutions now, or a unique approach to resolve an issue. These innovations enable the continued advancements in the growing automotive safety electronics industry. So in terms of automotive safety electronics, they have the same issues that other electronic design engineers have. And the big three that I decided to mention are communication, electromagnetic interference, or EMI, and power quality. So for automotive safety electronics, these three problems are sometimes more difficult to solve than in consumer electronics because we have size constraints, we have to maintain performance, we need that reliability, you know, these vehicles need to last sometimes decades, and then like any other project, it needs to be done on a budget and need to maintain that cost effectiveness so we can invest in the high-performance active devices and sensors, and we really don't want passive components to really take away from that design in that sense. Okay, let's start at the top. Talk to me about communication. If we talk about communications, RF communications, using standard antennas removes the need for expensive fees and long cycle times of custom antennas, but they have their own challenges. AVX offers a wide breadth of standard passive antenna technologies, stamped metal, embedded ceramic chip, patch, flexible printed circuit, external, of course, and more. And these really have established benchmarks for speed, range, efficiency, and reliability for the ISM, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, GPS, and cellular bands. So when we have all that in a standard antenna offering and we include the depth of supporting material, using a standard passive antenna, we reduce the challenges of using a standard antenna and it makes it more viable than a custom antenna design. At the completion of your design, You know, passing regulatory radiant emission specs will be easier. Having antennas for the vehicle-to-vehicle, vehicle-to-environment antennas, you're going to need a lot more bands to cover, you know, in one vehicle. So having efficient antennas that can do multiple bands in one device, you know, in a reliable and efficient way will be key. So if we move from designing in standard passive antennas, and then we have now our RF module terminating those with a coaxial cable can be difficult because sometimes it requires hand soldering. And doing that consistently, efficiently, I mean, think about the number of cars out there. If we were to, you know, manually terminate the coax cables, it would be very difficult to do consistently. So what we have is a RF coaxial cable IDC connector. An IDC is insulation displacement connector. And there are these blades or tines in the connector that pierce through the insulation of the coaxial cable. They're at different widths to get into the inner and then the outer conductor of the coax. And it's a fairly simple process. You um, terminate the SMT connector onto your board. 
And then you can just place the loose coax cable on top of the connector. There's a connector cap. The connectors are rated to operate from DC to 6 gigahertz with desirable forward transmission characteristics. It's very cost efficient to hand soldering. It's much easier to implement than hand soldering and also is a good replacement, cost efficient replacement for bulky connectors assemblies that may be heavy. You know that we have the weight concerns in vehicle applications, making the car light as possible. So moving from the antennas to now we have our RF module. Then uh, assembling our RF modules in automotive safety electronics, this RF coaxial cable IDC connector would be one of those enabling technologies to terminate cables. So that's good for the RF part of communication, but what about signal lines? So on a communications bus in a vehicle, whether it's CAN, FlexRay, LIN, Ethernet, every device connected to that communications bus is going to be sensitive to transients or be a potential victim of a transient. We have unexpected, unwanted overvoltage. It can be from a static shock, from an individual touching electronics in a vehicle. It can come from the inductive switching element of motors for windshield wipers, door windows, and also from transient called load dump in automotive where the alternator has sufficiently charged a battery after starting the vehicle. The battery's sufficiently charged now. The alternator is going to provide power to the rest of the circuits and then disconnects from the battery. The alternator can't regulate that voltage instantaneously. So a lot of times the ECU is the very first device coming down from the alternator. That overvoltage needs to be suppressed. And so when we talk about, you know, communication, we need circuit protection on all the devices on the communications bus. Some of the recent innovations in varistors have been to have a single component specified to suppress load dump transients. And DTVS diodes are commonly used. They're easy to implement. If we have a really strict size, weight, reliability concern, we need to explore varistors because they are multi-layer devices. They have a um, large internal volume to dissipate the energy from a transient, as opposed to a diode, which has a single PN junction service area to dissipate that energy. The quality of the ceramic grain structure in the multi-layer varistor device, this energy dissipation, it can handle repeated strikes in applications where you know this part of your circuit will be exposed to many transients repeatedly. The varistors would have enhanced reliability. Also, varistors do not derate with temperature. Diodes typically derate starting at room temperature or 25C. Varistors are capable of handling their rated power, their rated peak current, their rated energy to dissipate on a transient up to their rated temperature on the data sheet. And for high temperature applications, when you do a transient energy, transient voltage suppression cross between a varistor and a diode, you'll see that the varistors have identical or superior performance at the higher temperatures, but it'll be a much smaller part. Varistors also, because of the multi-layer construction, it uses ceramic material, there's going to be inherent capacitance. Communications buses also need some kind of EMI filtering. And you'll see on some schematics or some typical solutions for a communications bus, for circuit protection, we'll have a unidirectional or bidirectional diode on the communications bus and then a parallel EMC cap. Because of that built-in capacitance on varistors, we can reduce the number of diodes we have for circuit protections if we're using a unidirectional, and we can take out the EMC cap. We just select a varistor that has the um, capacitance that you need for the proper filtering. And so you can possibly reduce a three-component solution down to one component, which is a huge savings on the bill of materials, pick-and-place processes, and then with all the benefits of high temperature capability and the zero derating up to rated temperature. AVX has the first to industry 175C rated varistor that is ACQ, 200 qualified. For very high speed digital applications that are extremely sensitive to overvoltage and cannot handle much capacitive loading, a TVS diode is optimal. The AVX GigGuard are very small 0201, 0402 TVS diodes that have superior ESD ratings to typical DFN package TVS diodes. The GigGuard is packaged in a way that maximizes the surface area of the depletion region, increasing the efficiency of dissipating the energy from incoming transients. So we still have that small package in the GigGuard as a DFN 0201, 0402. 
but if you can see in the x-ray images there, the electrodes on the gigard are much larger, and that really acts as a heat sink. So when it sees an incoming transient, it's going to be able to dissipate a lot more energy than a wire-bonded TVS diode at the same size. Okay, so if we're talking about communication, we also have to talk about noise. So what about electromagnetic interference? AVX has made some developments in feed-through devices, feed-through capacitors, and also feed-through varistors. So what we can do with a feed-through device is you'll see the electrode patterns are unique. It's not the typical overlapping electrodes we see in a MLCC. We have now a set of electrodes that are perpendicular to the electrodes providing the capacitance. So we have four terminations now on a feed-through device. And you can see the two terminations on the side would um, go to ground and it would be set up in a series orientation as opposed to um, parallel for EMI suppression. And what this does is we're introducing a inductance that has much higher broadband filtering than what we would see in a traditional or standard MLCC. So a feed-through capacitor, using one of these, we would be able to consolidate multiple MLCCs uh, into one component in the feed-through cap. A typical setup would be parallel 1 nano, 10 nano, 100 nanofarad, um, 4.7 microfarad to get that really good broad spectrum EMI filtering. But the uh, performance on the feed throughs, we can consolidate a lot of those MLCCs into one device and increasing the range of frequency that a single capacitor can attenuate noise. And what we're going to get out of one feed through capacitor is about 760 megahertz of spectrum. That can attenuate up to 30 dB. The feed-through offerings that we have go from 70 megahertz to 6 gigahertz. So within that range of frequencies, we can get about 30 dB attenuation across 760 megahertz of spectrum. The same electrode and termination pattern can also be applied to varistor packages. We saw them earlier. They're you know standard multi-layer devices in EIA packages. This unique feed-through terminations with the um, perpendicular electrodes, and then the two terminations on the side for um, introducing that inductance that we want for desirable broadband EMI filtering. We can do that in a varistor package as well. AVX offers a stack device, the cap card. This combines two passive components into one footprint with all the benefits of having a varistor and MLCC in parallel. So with these innovative feed-through capacitors and feed-through varistors, and the cap guard, we have robust broadband EMI filtering on communications lines. So we have circuit protection in there, filtering out the noise on those lines. And these provide either a consolidation of standard MLCCs for a traditional solution. We can consolidate into one part in the feed-through capacitor. The um, feed-through varistor would have the circuit protection built in, but also the enhanced broadband EMI filtering. And the stack device, the cap card, would provide you the benefits of a varistor and MLCC, the circuit protection, and the EMI filtering onto one footprint. So, Daniel, we're talking about components that are good at EMI suppression. But what does that really mean for me in my design? So, a lot of designs will have to pass regulated radiated emissions Here's an example of a GM specification. You can see here the range of frequencies that the feed through and the transfeed and the cap guard apply and um, would be able to offer the size reduction of circuit in those frequencies. So what does this mean for your application? We have these advanced EMI suppression devices. Well, this means that your design would be able to achieve the, the regulated radiant emission specifications and pass the regulated testing easier with fewer or one device in a reduced footprint. So on the right, you'll see an image of the varistor transfeed that we have. Its construction is identical to the feed-through that you saw earlier. Okay, cool. So can we talk about safety when it comes to power quality? When we're talking about automotive safety electronics and critical safety, some applications need to be powered at all times. These devices on the power line use redundant capacitors in series on voltage lines to help guarantee that circuits will be provided enough power and to be able to function properly under harsh conditions, sometimes emergency conditions. And when we're assembling 
what we also need to be prepared for on these passive components, you know, we have mounted them on the board and then we're going to assemble all the electronics in a vehicle. Sometimes it's manual. What we don't think about is that ceramic capacitors, that they're brittle, but they are. And so let's say um, a technician is installing a um, circuit board in the dash and it needs to be screwed in. There's some flexure to the board. So what we have in the FlexiSafe device is a multilayer ceramic capacitor that has cascaded electrodes. And what this does is what we have internally in a single chip essentially is two series capacitors. Critical safety applications commonly use redundant capacitors in series on voltage lines to help guarantee that circuits will be provided enough power to be able to function properly under harsh conditions, sometimes emergency conditions. A common solution that is implemented is two series MLCCs, but oriented 90 degrees to one another. And why they do that is to mitigate MLCC cracking from PCB flexure or thermal coefficient differences. They're in series so that if one goes, we'll have another cap there to ensure that the critical safety application has guaranteed power. Our FlexiSafe uses a um, flexible termination layer, but also internal, when we're looking at the electrodes and the dielectric layers, we have cascaded or floating electrodes between the counter electrodes. And what we've built in is two series capacitors and so what we have in one device is, you know, essentially a one component solution to the um, common solution we see with the two MLCCs in the 90 degree orientation. We don't need them perpendicular anymore. We have one device and then the FlexiTerm layer affords that two and a half or more greater board flexure capability than a standard multilayer ceramic capacitor. So we have that benefit in terms of physical stress and then the cascaded electrodes offer the, the two series capacitors. Critical safety applications operating at lower voltage levels can make use of the OxyCap. They have a self-healing mechanism and do not pose a threat of a short circuit like that of other capacitor technologies if driven to failure. Instead, the capacitance decreases and leakage increases, but it still remains a capacitor, providing guaranteed cap, just like the redundant two MLCC devices in series common solution that we saw. Okay, so what about safety applications that require more power out of a capacitor? So we're going to move on to supercapacitors. Supercapacitors are unique because they are versatile. They can provide a near battery-like power source on voltage lines for applications like dying gas, e-call, ADAS transitions, where we're going to transfer from a self-driving car to a human-controlled car now, and other energy holdup applications. They can supplement batteries by performing peak power functions that reduce the depth of discharge on a battery, greatly extending lifetime and travel range of a single battery charge. They are also great for energy recovery applications like uh, regenerative braking or electric suspension because they capture energy more efficiently than a battery. And also they have um, very large charge discharge cycles too. We have the cylindrical modules, the best cap, prisma cap, and also custom. A discrete supercapacitor would have a lower voltage rating than typically seen in other capacitor technologies. And so what we're going to need in many instances as a complete supercapacitor solution to a safety application, again, providing the peak power or the energy regeneration, you know, superior to a battery system, we're going to need a lot of times a custom module. And so what AVX has are these completed modules off the shelf, they're standard but they came out of a custom design effort. They go up to 48 volt, 165 farad modules, and we have others. You know, we're talking about automotive and the 48 volt lines that we see now. You know, we have a custom module that's already ready to go. Don't need to worry about balancing it. All that's done for you. It's just ready to go. Supercapacitors are great to provide the high currents needed for the motors that close and open um, locks, door latches, especially if the power has been disconnected from a battery, let's say after an accident, uh, for safety reasons, 
a vehicle in the event of a crash, it has detected a crash to prevent a fire, it will cut off the electronics from the battery. So what supercapacitors can do, they have that, you know, that near battery-like characteristic. And what they can do is store charge for emergency personnel to later approach the vehicle and be able to unlock the doors. The supercapacitor is able to retain their charge for days and provide that high current needed to the door latches and the locks to unlock them. Supercapacitors can provide a near battery-like power source on voltage lines for dying gasp, e-call, and ADAS transitions and other energy holdup applications. They're great at capturing energy. Take, for example, the wheels on your car. We don't feel the bumps on the road, but our wheels experience a lot of trauma. And what we can do is instead of wasting that energy experienced on the wheels into the leaf springs or into the suspension system of a vehicle, we can replace it with an um, electric suspension system. And what we do is we um, capture that energy from the road that's being delivered to the wheels, putting it into a bank of supercapacitors because they're more efficient at capturing energy than a battery would be adding electronics to a vehicle. Well, you know, why do we want to add an electric suspension system if we don't have to? Well, because the supercapacitor is the enabling part of it. You know, I mentioned the high number of charge and discharge cycles that supercapacitors have. It can also capture the energy, but also deliver the energy back into the suspension system to balance your car. And in performance vehicles, when, you know, electronic vehicles really move into the, uh, you know, the performance scene, these supercapacitors will be um, enabling in that sense. Uh, we also have a connector. It is a receptacle for our supercapacitor cylindrical devices. This provides the benefit of instead of relying on the leads of the cylindrical device, um, you can put it into the connector and then have that simply mounted to your board and it'll provide the superior retention to the board and the resistance to vibration and shock than the leads would provide. Cool. All right. Well, Daniel, can you recap your main points for me? So we've been talking about Passive components for automotive safety electronics. Well, you know, what we really talked about was three common design issues, uh, communication, electromagnetic interference, and uh, power quality in those issues uh, span, you know, many electronics. But again, we narrow it down by talking automotive safety, how they have size, weight, constraints. But these devices, they need to perform, they need to be reliable, they need to be cost efficient. Yeah, I have a six-year-old daughter and, you know, they say, you know, sometimes there's going to be self-driving cars. Yeah, so I'm horrified because I want these issues to be um, taken care of and design engineers don't want to spend too much time on the passive parts of their designs. So we enable it by providing uh, some kind of size reduction on, on their footprint of their design. You know, using standard antennas removes the need for expensive fees, long cycle times for custom antenna designs. Having a broad range of um, technologies and offerings that we have along with the supporting material makes it more of a viable option than a custom design in terms of antennas. In reversers, we can um, reduce the size and the weight and the bill of materials of, of a circuit protection solution uh, by consolidating that common solution we see with the, um, the, the diodes and the EMC cap. You can put that into one device in the varistor. For EMI, we had the innovations in the feed-through capacitor, the feed-through varistor, and then the cap guard. And then for the power issues, we have capacitors that are very safe for these critical safety applications. In the FlexiSafe, we provide the redundant series capacitor. And then in the OxyCap, we have the guaranteed cap there inherent in the technology where it fails resistive as opposed to failing short that we see in other capacitor technologies. Supercapacitors are great because they can supplement batteries by performing the uh, high peak power functions that reduce the depth of discharge on a battery. Also, they're great for um, energy recovery applications, regenerative braking, electric suspension. They just capture energy more efficiently than a battery. And then um, for those uh, energy holdup applications like dying gas or emergency call, the ADAS transitions when the regular power source or the, or the battery has been disconnected from the vehicle electronics. In those situations, you know, those emergency situations, the supercapacitors enable the um, electronics to still have power for, you know, one last transmission to GPS for location, storing that charge for emergency um, personnel to come and unlock the um, electronic um, locks and latches on, on a vehicle. 
Uh, that's where supercapacitors really enable the power quality for automotive safety electronics. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me, Daniel. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about AVX's passive component solutions for automotive safety electronics. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it, it's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal. <laughs>